All right, let's pick up where we left off in class. So we've gone over the federal court system, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. Courts of Appeal, and U.S. District Courts. Um, we've talked a little bit about the difference between the federal judiciary and the state judiciary. So let's spend some time on the state courts now. So structures of the state courts typically vary, but they pattern themselves after the federal judiciary, including having a state Supreme Court, um, state court of appeals, and trial courts. Um, so state Supreme Courts are the courts of last resort for the majority of state laws. So remember, um, we talked about states having their own constitution and the state Supreme Court is ultimately responsible for interpreting those constitutional questions of state constitution. If it's a federal constitution uh, question, then that's where you can go to the to SCOTUS, the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, state appellate courts um, typically um, make determinations on all filed cases and many of those cases are filed pro se, which means without legal representation. Um, the number of judges serving on those courts vary from state to state, but it's normally a three judge panel. Um, and then you have your trial courts, which are really like your, your county um, superior courts. You'll hear them called superior courts. Um, they uh, have general jurisdiction um, to hear all criminal and civil cases. Uh, your trial courts are your original jurisdiction courts. So remember, original jurisdiction means that they hear the case first. Then we have um, courts that are known as problem-solving courts. Um, you will also hear me uh, talk about these as accountability courts. Uh, problem-solving and accountability courts are, are the same thing. Um, these are courts that, estab that were established to tackle certain issues. So um, we know that the, that the criminal justice system is kind of like a catch-all, like you have uh, addiction issues, mental health issues, specialty issues of different offenders. And so what we see is um, a rise in the usage of accountability courts and um, those started off with um, what is called drug courts or as your book deems a treatment court. So drug courts were first implemented in, 18, or in 1989 and have grown in popularity. There are approximately 2,600 drug courts across the nation um, and they target adult offenders um, and um, there are some juvenile drug courts. I actually worked in a juvenile drug court as a probation officer. And so um, the goal of drug court is to target the substance abuse issue through treatment and collaboration. So you typically will meet um, monthly as a team and it's a team approach. So you have uh, probation, you have the judge, you have service providers, all meeting together to make sure that these clients are, um, one, adhering to the law, but two, making sure that they're addressing their substance use issues. So problem solving courts or accountability courts are really key to kind of um, helping in treatment. Um, you also have family uh, treatment courts and um, we don't have many of those in the state of Georgia. They are currently on the rise, but family treatment courts are um, courts that have substance abuse issues, like the clients have substance abuse issues, and typically have lost custody or have uh, deep involvement. And so uh, the goal of family treatment court is for the parents to address their own substance abuse issues as well as working with child welfare and service providers to reunify the family. Um, you have DUI courts, uh, which if you get a DUI, something like that. Um, you have um, 
behavioral health courts or mental health courts that address with um, people who have significant mental health issues and you notice that you can't really treat them like you treat everyone else um, because of their mental health issues. And so the focus of mental health court is really to marry the judiciary and the service together to get the treatment that these people need. Um, and then you have uh, others that are um, that are on the rise. Uh, Veterans Court um, is is another accountability court that is on the rise, and they are specifically geared toward veterans who are in the criminal justice system because of their veteran issues. So, like PTSD and things like that. We know if, when you come when veterans come back from war that they um, PTSD most likely and they're high risk for domestic violence and things like that. So those specific VA courts deal with those issues and that clientele. Um, again, marrying service array, uh, judicial law, things like that together. So what are the role of judges in the judiciary? Well, we talked a little bit about this on, um, we talked about the U.S. Supreme Court, but the role of the judges, they're ultimately responsible for func for the functionings of the courtroom. Um, they set the rules of the courtroom. Um, they make decisions as to what is appropriate conduct, what evidence can be introduced, um, and making sure that the court runs um, like it's supposed to. There are things called bench trials um, where the defendant decides that they don't want to go um, in front of a jury of their peers. So they ask the judge to just rule and make a determination. And so in bench trials, the judge ultimately hears the evidence without a jury present and makes a ruling on guilt or innocence. There ultimately you have judges who set the sentencing um, if a defendant is found guilty. Um, sometimes they take the jury recommendations, sometimes they don't. In certain states, judges can overrule the jury um, decision. Uh, that happened recently, um, probably about within the past 10 years. Um, judge overruled a jury decision on guilt and found the person innocent. So it that's all done through state law. Um, not every judge can do that and it just depends on what the state law is. But ultimately the role of the judge is to um, oversee the courtroom proceedings. So how are judges selected? Well if you think back to um, <clears throat> probably our first couple of weeks together. Um, you know that like, well, when we were talking about police, you know that it was very, um, in a way, uh, politics played a role in, in selecting police chiefs and, and sheriffs, and it was the hierarchy landowners and things like that. Well, we have moved to something called the Missouri Plan. And basically the Missouri Plan is a merit-based system. And it attempts to eliminate the politics from the selection process. And it looks at um, <clears throat> kind of the individual based on their merits. So typically in the Missouri Plan, um, you get the governor makes the appoint initial appointment. Um, they have a selection committee that kind of goes through everything and gives the, the person, um, the governor, a list of people that they can choose from. The governor appoints them based on their merits, um, and then they will go through a general election at the time of, of that. Um, but there are certain qualifications. So one, they have to live in the state. Um, they ha If they're serving on a, on a federal court, they have to live within the, the district that they're serving. Um, they have to be a lawyer. They have to have a license to practice law. 
Um, now, with that being said, um, certain magistrate judges do not have to have law degrees, or they don't have to be certified by the bar. However, in criminal courts and federal courts, you do have to be a licensed lawyer, um, and you do have to be a member of the state bar. Um, and then you have to fall within the ages of 25 to 70. So there is an age limit. We know that the court system does get um, does get bogged down. I mean, there's a lot going on. Um, and so there's a constant kind of philosophical debate around um, the Sixth Amendment and kind of how we are making sure um, that the Sixth Amendment is applied. So the Sixth Amendment guarantees a right to a speedy trial. Um, and we actually kind of clarified that a little bit um, with the Federal Speedy Trial Act of 1974, which requires those charged with a crime be indicted within 30 days and the trial occurs within 70 days. So it put kind of like guardrails and time frames on this. So um, delays can be beneficial, but they can also hinder. Um, a lot of times we see defendants waiving their right to a speedy trial um, if we know that it's going to take a while. Um, but it's common um, that we recognize that even though there's congestion in the court, defendants still have a right to a speedy trial and they have a Sixth Amendment right and they have to have those trials within certain time frames. And then finally, your book uh, talks about some of the diversity issues in um, the judiciary. Um, the judiciary used to be a white man's game. Um, it has for a long time um, been um, not very diverse. Um, you have a case from 1873 known as Bradwell v. State of Illinois. And this took up the issue of women entering law. And basically, um, Myra Bradwell uh, clerked for her husband who was a lawyer, and basically knew the laws of the land. And she applied to go to law school and was denied based on her status as a woman. And so she appealed that all the way up to, um, way up to the Supreme Court. Um, at, in, there wasn't really law schools. Um, it was apprenticeship. So she had applied to be an apprentice um, and was denied based on her, the fact that she was a woman. So the Supreme Court at that time ultimately ruled um, that she did not have a 14th Amendment right um, to go into law. In fact, they said um, the paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. So you see in the 1800s this notion that women's role in society is to be a wife and to be a mother, nothing else. And the Constitution did not protect women um, until much, much later. Um, Ms. Bradwell eventually um, went to law school and or was admitted into the Illinois Bar in 1890. Um, but it, it was a battle for her. Um, ultimately, the first woman to be accepted into the bar um, was Belva Lockwood in Washington, D.C. Um, consequently, it was 1873 that Belva um, was accepted into the bar. And after that, she, her, her acceptance kind of triggered events to help other courts. Um, I have some statistics for you. You can see um, of the 112 justices who have served on the Supreme Court, only four were women, um, and, and that's now five. Five have been women. Um, all have been within my lifetime. 
Um, women comprise only 10% of the 10th Circuit's active members, um, and about 30% of active U.S. district judges are women. Um, so you see, women, it, law is still a man's game. Um, 68 women of color are serving as active federal judicial judges, um, and several or seven federal courts of appeals have no women judges at all. Um, and as far as race goes, I have some of the um, key um, components of race that it's gone through. I will bring your attention to um, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was the first black Supreme Court justice appointed in 1967, and he was revolutionary. Um, he was appointed by Lyndon B. Johnson and served until 1991. And he was the one that argued the landmark case of Brown v. Board of Education before the Supreme Court um, as the chief counsel. And because of his victory in Brown v. Board of Education, that kind of propelled him into his seat as a Supreme Court justice. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor, who is still a, a associate justice, was the first Hispanic um, associate justice to the Supreme Court. And it's not on my um, not on my uh, PowerPoint, but we actually have the first um, African American female on the court as well um, currently. So you can see that diversity is not huge. Um, we have diversified the Supreme Court a little. Um, we have more women, we have more, more minorities, but there's still a lot of work to do um, through the judiciary in general. Um, all right, so that is all for the judicial, uh, for the courts and the judiciary. Um, please make sure you read chapter seven, um, do your quiz, and I will see everyone in class.